Okay. Uh, Thank you. So uh, we are uh, very happy to have with us um, uh, Dr. Grant Hyman from the Kavli Institute for Theoretical Physics at the University of California at Santa Barbara. Uh, some of you have uh, heard him recently giving a technical talk um, in the say, high energy physics uh, seminar series. Um, and we are very happy to have him again for a colloquium uh, on the journey to the limits of quantum field theory. Thank you very much. Wonderful introduction, and uh, it's it's great to have the opportunity to be uh, with you again, uh, at least at least virtually, to to speak to all of you. So right, so today we're going to go on a journey to the limits of quantum field theory, and what I mean by that is we will be trying to figure out what are the boundaries on the possible laws of particle physics, and how can we use these ideas that come from uh, very formal concepts in theory to actually say something quite concrete about near-term uh, experiments and phenomenology and what it can tell us about uh, new physics that might really be right around the corner. So going into this, we all know the boson has been discovered at the Large Hadron Collider uh, in 2012. You can see the, the beautiful pictures of the LHC here and the, and the famous of the 125 GeV Higgs detection uh, from ATLAS and CMS. Interesting, unfortunately, uh, so far, no other new fundamental uh, particles have been uh, discovered yet. Certainly the LHC continues to do uh, really important physics, but we haven't seen any new on-shell fundamental state uh, as of yet. So we might be in the situation in particle physics that new physics in the form of new particle states might be at a higher mass scale than uh, current experiments can access. So this means that our first glimpses of new physics could come from small effects, small deviations of the standard model that appear in the form of echoes of the ultraviolet uh, at low energy scales. So let me draw an energy axis here uh, running from the lowest energies, the longest uh, link scales, we call generically the infrared, up to uh, the highest energies, uh, smallest fundamental link scales of the, the ultraviolet, where quantum gravity lives up here. And there are hopefully new massive particles, potentially supersymmetry at some intermediate scale. And we're currently down here, where our experiments are probing around a TEV uh, at the LHC. Tiny effects being encoded from quantum gravity and new massive states in the form of deviations in the low energy description of the laws of physics. And a beautiful set of tools for mathematically understanding these small effects that was developed over the course of the 20th century by Ken Wilson and others, uh, which goes by the name of effective field theory. So this talk is going to be about effective field theory. So let me uh, back up and just explain a little bit more about what I mean uh, by effective field theory before getting into uh, what we're going to do in this talk. So in theoretical particle physics, uh, the fundamental objects of interest are quantum fields. So examples are a scalar, a fermion, uh, gauge fields, or even the, the metric describing the geometry of space-time itself can be treated as a quantum field in, in an appropriate uh, generically via interactions like cubic scalar interactions for Fermi interactions, uh, non interactions, or even graviton-graviton uh, interactions through uh, the Einstein-Hilbert app. Interactions is packaged in, in the Lagrangian. It's our mathematical way of uh, formulating and packaging uh, the laws of nature, the equations of motion in theoretical and uh, a Lagrangian is just a set of operators uh, times times some couplings uh, OI. Uh, I will. Uh, can you uh, can you hear me better now? Uh, right now, I can hear you. Before, your voice came in and went. I don't know if uh, that's the same experience for everyone. Okay. It might be a function of my earphones. I'll just go without them. Okay. Uh, Thank you. There. Better? Okay. Good. So what we're talking about are Lagrangians, uh, uh, operators times couplings. Okay. 
Uh, and it's useful to organize a Lagrangian according to its uh, mass dimension. Uh, so the leading order terms will be things like kinetic terms, uh, Maxwell uh, gauge field terms, even the standard model, all things of mass dimension uh, less than or equal to four. So throughout this talk where I say dimension, I don't mean dimensions of space and time, I mean uh, unit dimensions, units, units of mass uh, in, in units where h bar and the speed of light are set to one. So you can in, induce deviations from your leading order action uh, through so-called higher dimension operators. So these have uh, mass dimensions larger than four and they encode echoes of new physics at the ultraviolet scale M, the, the scale appearing in the denominator here. So the Wilson coefficients, uh, these, these Cs have values that depend on the details of the microscopic physics, uh, what states and interactions exist at, uh, at the high energy scale. And if we know the full theory, we can, we can calculate these Wilson coefficients. But if all we have access to is uh, the low energy laws of physics, then these are, in a sense, unknown dial settings uh, in, in the laws of nature that a priori we have to keep free. So let's, let's go through an example, uh, a massless scalar uh, coupled to a massive uh, state sigma through some cubic interaction that you can see here. So you can scatter two phi's off of each other by exchanging a massive sigma through, through this theory. But if we're at energy scales below big M, then that means we can't see sigma. We can't produce it on shell. And so we can do the path integral uh, in an approximation over uh, sigma to obtain the EFT at low energies. And so what we effectively see is just a quartic interaction. Uh, the low energy experimenter would just see a quartic with some with some uh, coupling. And in this example, we can compute the Wilson coefficient because we know the UV completion. And so we compute the Wilson coefficient of this d5 to the 4 operator. But what if the UV completion is, is unknown? Can any Lagrangian be a consistent effective field theory? And so let me draw the space of all possible theories. Just it's, it's some space of all actions that you can write down. And it turns out the answer to this question is no. The set of consistent effective field theories is a strict subset of, of the set of all possible Lagrangians. There are vast swaths of parameter space that are strictly forbidden by bedrock principles of quantum field theory. And how, how, how is this possible? How can a theory be, uh, be forbidden? And what I mean is that certain combinations uh, in, in the menu of all particles, uh, interactions, couplings, and symmetries, certain combinations uh, are provably inconsistent with principles that we think should be true of any well-behaved uh, fundamental uh, physical theory. Things like unitarity of quantum mechanics, so quantum mechanical conservation of probability. Uh, causality, that is forbidding things from, in a certain sense, going faster than the speed of light, and so forbidding time machines, if you will. Uh, locality, or in, in the context of scattering amplitudes, uh, the analytic uh, structure of scattering amplitudes, or thermodynamics. And so you can think of all of these uh, different fundamental principles as being grouped together in some list of requirements that we'll call infrared consistency. So basic well-behavedness in, in the IR that we extrapolate uh, to the UV. And over the past uh, few years, there's been a whole lot of research uh, in, into bounding all sorts of different EFTs using infrared consistency. Uh, this started off in, in this well-known paper by Adams, uh, Arkani Hamed, uh, Dubovsky, uh, uh, Sergey, who's here in the audience, and, and others. It's a beautiful paper. And uh, we've since taken this and bound, bounded many, many theories, mostly theories of particular interest to high energy theorists uh, and, and formal uh, gravity theorists, things like uh, quantum corrections to the Einstein equations, higher derivative uh, terms in the gravity action, Einstein-Maxwell theory, et cetera. But in the past couple years, uh, I've really begun uh, taking this set of tools and applying it to the full-blown EFT of the standard model uh, in a way that's much more comprehensive than has been uh, done before. And so that's what I'll be talking about for most of this talk, uh, these, these papers here. And right now is, is a really interesting time to be doing this. There are compelling experimental reasons for applying IR consistency to the standard model EFT. Uh, indeed, our, our experimental friends will take some parameter space of deviations from the standard model and place, place bounds on, on, on them using colliders or, or other experiments. And these bounds generically are ellipses around the origin, uh, some error bars. But IR consistency bounds 
uh, typically cut through order one fractions of that parameter space, ruling out huge chunks of it. And so you can see that IR consistency is going to place powerful theoretical priors on parameter space. It will make experimental bounds uh, that much more uh, statistically significant. Or to put it another way, were uh, experiments to find a non-zero deviation from the standard model in one of the forbidden regions, uh, unlikely of course, but it, were that to happen, it would mean that the ultraviolet, the high energy fundamental physics in that theory fundamentally violated one of our uh, cherished beliefs about how quantum field theory works. And so that would, that would be really powerful on its own. So this program of IR consistency, in a sense, not only tells us what new physics ought to be possible, but it also allows us to convert uh, existing experiments like, like the LHC into machines to test the basic axioms of QFT up to really high energies. And that's exciting uh, in its own right. And indeed, the, the Large Hadron Collider uh, is already bounding uh, the higher dimension operators in the standard model EFT. So these are recent plots from Atlas and CMS bounding precisely operators of the form we'll think about in this talk, but without yet uh, having considered uh, the IR consistency program, because this is, this is so new. Good. So uh, now let me, let me show you briefly how it is possible that we can bound uh, theories using, using inferred consistency. How can we rule out theories using causality uh, and the properties of scattering amplitudes. So let's, uh, let's take a massless scalar with a shift symmetry as, as our example theory that we thought about earlier. So it's uh, d phi squared plus the leading higher derivative term is d phi to the fourth. And here we'll let the Wilson coefficient c be some a priori arbitrary number. Okay, I can compute the two to two scattering amplitude uh, for, for phi phi scattering uh, in terms of the Mandelstam variables, S, T, and U. These are just uh, Lorentz invariant, uh, Lorentz invariance built out, of, built out of the momenta. And I can consider the forward amplitude, which just means uh, forward in, in amplitudes parlance just means the in-state equals the out-state. For a scalar, it's just a statement about uh, kinematics, about the momenta. But when we start having particles with spin or with extra internal quantum numbers, it will mean the full in-state equals the full out-state. So that will, that will come about later. OK, so we're going to do some operations on this forward amplitude. All right, what I'm going to do is do a contour integral in the complex S plane. S is just the center of mass energy uh, squared. And so I do this contour integral around uh, the origin. And that just extracts the Wilson coefficient in the low energy effective theory by the residue theorem. So that's just math. But physics comes in at the next step where I use the analytic structure of the amplitude to deform the contour into a new contour C prime. So what, what does it mean to use analyticity here? Well, a fundamental fact about the laws of physics is that, is that they're local. They are, uh, if, if I wiggle some field here, it doesn't instantaneously uh, wiggle in, in the Andromeda galaxy. Influences take time to propagate, which means that the laws of nature depend on a finite number of derivatives. Or in, in momentum space, uh, physical processes care about finite numbers of powers of momentum. Or in complex momentum space, um, amplitudes should be analytic functions of complex momentum, except at well-defined locations, like the branch cuts along the real S-axis, here associated with on-shell multi-particle production, or poles associated with on-shell single-particle production. Okay, so that's where locality is coming in. You can show that the boundary term here on the big circle at infinity will vanish. Uh, you can justify this in a couple ways. You can either make uh, the state slightly massive by IR deforming and use uh, the Frassar bound, which follows from uh, unitarity and the partial wave expansion. Or even more basically, all that, all that you need to assume for the boundary term at infinity to vanish is that the amplitude at infinity will blow up less quickly with large momentum than, than it does from the naive IR uh, expansion. We expect this to happen because one of the main points of a UV completion is to make amplitudes more well-behaved, is to, is to not violate perturbative unitarity. So the boundary term will vanish here. Crossing symmetry, this is just exchanging particles one and three, uh, again, by, by definition. And using the Schwartz reflection principle, again, just math uh, by how you, how you can analytically continue functions between the two halves of the complex S-plane. So 
ultimately what we've gotten is that the Wilson coefficient is an integral over the positive real s-axis of the imaginary part of the forward amplitude. And here's where physics will come in again. Uh, the imaginary part of the forward amplitude is, by quantum mechanical unitarity, just equal to the cross-section times some powers of momentum needed to make the units work out. Uh, so cross-sections are, are areas. They're, they're physical. They're, by definition, positive. In the sense, the cross-section is a bunch of sums of norm squares of, of kets of quantum mechanical states. So what we found is that C encodes some information about the UV, and it does so in a way that's manifestly positive by essentially by quantum mechanics and locality. So that was a very quantum mechanical proof of this, but you can prove the same thing with uh, causality. You can prove it entirely classically. So we can compute the equation of motion for, for this theory for the phi state, and we can expand around a condensate background. So we can put d phi equal to some constant four vector. This is like a scalar version of, of an electric field. And I can expand around phi bar, with var phi, and compute the equation of motion here. And this is sort of like computing an amplitude. It's like taking an amplitude and pinning two of its legs to some classical background. OK. I can plug in a plane wave ansatz and compute a dispersion relation, which allows me to compute uh, the velocity here for the perturbation. How fast does it move in this background? And it goes like one, goes like the speed of light minus a positive, a, a number that's manifestly positive times C. So if C were negative, uh, you could generate a causal paradox uh, straightforwardly. You take two bubbles of the condensate, give them a sufficiently large relative boost and send signals back and forth. And you'll get the signal back uh, before you started, which would violate uh, Cauchy evolution, it would violate our intuitive notion of causality, and this is unacceptable. So C has to be positive, again, by purely classical analysis. So what I'm going to do in the rest of this talk is use uh, technology like this and uh, further dispersion relations, further insight from amplitudes that we'll develop as we go to bound uh, the corrections to the standard model. All right, so let's actually leap into uh, the standard model EFT. So we're going to be using all the different parts of the standard model in this talk. This image is from uh, the movie Particle Fever. But we're going to start with, with the blue ring here, the, the gauge bosons. So the gluons, the W and Z bosons, and, and the photons. So let's place IR consistency bounds on, on this EFT. So first, we have to build it. So for general SUN, let's, uh, starting with the gluons, uh, a basis of quartic dimension 8 operators is as follows. There are eight types of uh, CP conserving operators, that is, operators that conserve time reversal symmetry, and four uh, CP breaking operators in this basis. So we'll keep all of these for now, all 12. And to zeroth order in the Wilson coefficients, we can write the Yang-Mills equation of motion and expand around a background solution that's sort of the analog of that uh, d phi equals constant solution we considered in the toy theory. So we're going to consider plane wave uh, perturbations around this solution. We'll choose colors that commute uh, so that the equations of motion are still solved. And we'll compute the speed of these perturbations. So after doing a giant calculation, the result is again, one minus some positive number times something in brackets that goes like the Wilson coefficients. So it goes like the C1 through C8 and the, and the C tildes. So the thing to notice is that these A and B uh, constants go like the CP even coefficients. And this big C goes like the CP odd coefficients. And they'll appear qualitatively differently in the result. I can make this look simpler by introducing some coordinates. So we just require the thing in parentheses to be positive in order for causality to be satisfied. AX squared plus BY squared plus CXY is positive, OK? Uh, I can rewrite this using some angles. And so I, I get a one parameter family of, posi of positivity bounds that has to be satisfied for all psi just by causality. Uh, I can ultimately get the same thing from scattering amplitudes. If I compute gluon gluon scattering in this theory, uh, I find that the S squared coefficient for gluon gluon scattering goes like the same combinations of Wilson coefficients where here this angle psi is the, the angle between the polarization vectors of the two incoming gluons. So causality and quantum mechanics are both telling us the same thing. And we can, we can, mod, uh, we can marginalize over psi to get a minimal set of bounds. We get that A and B are both individually positive, but that C squared is upper bounded by the product of uh, A and B. So that's, that's interesting because we, we get positivity statements then on the CP even coefficients. 
But for the CP violating terms, what we get is a magnitude bound. We get that the CP violating Wilson coefficients for operators like, uh, like these have to be upper bounded by their CP even cousins. So uh, nature forbids CP violation from being too large. And interestingly, this third condition, we could never have gotten it had we considered uh, just the scattering amplitudes of fixed helicity amplitudes. We only got it from marginalizing over all polarizations or equivalently by considering arbitrary superpositions of all helicity amplitudes. Good, all right. So what does this mean for the actual operators in the uh, bosonic sector of the standard model uh, effective field theory? Well, uh, we want all the four point operators that have uh, four derivatives and or field strengths that we can build in, in the bosonic standard model EFT. So the gauge field strengths, we have one associated with U1 hypercharge, uh, the Bs, we have the Ws associated with SU2 left, and we have uh, the gluons associated with SU3 color, uh, plus the Higgs doublet. We can combine these in all possible different ways to generate the four point uh, dimension eight operators. And they're the following. So there's the gauge self cortex, uh, of various types, uh, gauge cross cortex, so uh, operators that contain both Bs and Ws or Bs and Gs, etc. Uh, the Higgs self cortex, so these are kind of like the D phi to the four operators. They're D Higgs to the fourth, and they come in three different types depending on how we uh, marry up the SU2 uh, doublet indices. And finally, operators that contain uh, their cross cortex containing both. Higgs and, uh, and gauge field strings. And uh, among the 64 quartic bosonic operators at dimension eight in the standard model uh, of which there are 39 CP conserving, conserving and 25 CP violating, we found 27 independent uh, bounds of which 20 are positivity bounds shown here for the operators of different types and seven magnitude bounds on the CP uh, violating coefficients. So you see again, these families of two positivity bounds corresponding to one magnitude bound uh, repeats over and over in, in, in the standard model. Grant, may I ask a question at this point? Yeah. So uh, the fact that now we are talking about, like in this toy example, here you're talking about massive particles. How does this affect? This oh, balance? good, uh, right. So. So uh, I'll, I'll answer that question in, in, in a two-part answer. No, number one is in, in the standard model EFT, uh, how, how the, theory, the, the theory is formulated in the unbroken phase of the standard model, which means that we're in effect assuming that uh, the new physics is coming in above, above you know, a TeV scale or above a few hundred GeV. So everything can be treated to good approximation as, as nearly massless. Uh, and well, but that means there are some corrections to this balance. Yeah, there, right? there, there are definitely going to be, well, there, there can be corrections, but we're, we're assuming that those, those corrections are small. And the, the, other, the other point I was just going to make is that the, all the dispersion relation uh, stuff that I talked about earlier with, with the D5 to the four uh, theory ports over to, to massive uh, theories uh, fairly straightforwardly. So even, even if the speed is getting corrections due to the mass, the, the scattering amplitudes, you can still bound, roughly speaking, the S squared coefficient of a scattering amplitude, even for massive theories. And it works almost the same way. Uh, yeah, good, good question. I, I, can, I can show you the details about how massive dispersion relations, how the story is slightly different, um, probably, probably offline, but yeah. Um, can, can I ask, this is uh, Kyle Kramer, can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Um, in terms of the, you know, there's the sort of like basis ambiguity in these EFTs and there's like various different ways that you can do things. I don't have a very good feel for like if someone, you know, if like the LHC group was using a different basis than you use for driving these, how hard it would be to uh, to like re-express these bounds. Is it, is it some simple like linear transformation or is it uh, yeah, you it, need to kind of go through the uh, analysis again? It's, it's basically linear transformation. So what, what I've done here is I've, I've constructed a basis, but this is certainly not the unique basis, but there are, there are ways you can rotate bases among each other. Uh, another way of saying this is, suppose I wrote down every possible operator, so not just the basis, but uh, every possible combination of way of rewriting the standard model fields. That would mean that, so there would be redundancies, but there, there are certain combinations, certain linear combinations of uh, the Wilson coefficients that are field redefinition invariant. 
And crucially, the things that show up in observables, like in scattering amplitudes or like in the speed calculation, must be built out of those field redefinition invariant uh, quantities. So even though I've chosen a basis here, uh, the, the, physics, the physics is invariant. Yeah, no, that for sure. Yeah, I, I was thinking more kind of the practical part of like if you wanted to overlay these yeah, uh, constraints I, on a I, I don't yeah. think. I mean, in, in principle, it's it's just linear re-identifications of, uh, of of the coefficients. I don't think that's worked out explicitly in the literature at dimension eight. It, it might be done at dimension six, but I mean, it's 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 straightforward. You can do it in Mathematica if 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 you need to. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Good. Uh, but the, what I wanted to mention is already, just from these bounds, uh, you can show that IR consistency has given us a hundred million fold reduction in the parameter space of the dimension six uh, standard model EFT. So it's, it's hugely cut down uh, the, the space of allowed Wilson coefficients for deviations from the standard model. So it's, it's a very powerful uh, technology to use to try and constrain new physics. And one of the first things we should do after having placed some of these bounds is to check them. So we can check them by thinking about example ultraviolet completions and making sure the bounds are manifestly satisfied. So one way of doing this is by thinking about some massive state coupled to the gauge bosons. So some massive state, I'll write it as phi. And if I have phi charged under an arbitrary representation of the standard model gauge group, so an arbitrary weight representation of SU3 times SU2 times U1, and I take a loop of it and integrate it out, uh, I can get quartic gauge boson operators among the Bs, Ws, and Gs. And so what this is, is a, a huge generalization of the Euler-Heisenberg-Lagrangian, where in, in QED, you can take an electron loop and it gives you the first nonlinear terms in QED by, by generating uh, the four photon uh, terms. So people have computed what the Wilson coefficients of uh, such a UV completion are. They're, uh, they're here, you can, you can look them up. But the important thing is that if you take all these Wilson coefficients, plug them into our bounds and check, one finds that they're all, they all give manifestly positive results. So all possible uh, gauge field bounds that we find are satisfied indeed by arbitrary one loop completions. So that's good as an example. Uh, another, another sanity check we can do is uh, think about the Higgs operators. So here I can be a little more uh, concrete and show you example tree level completions. So we found three bounds on these three operators. And so the claim is that well-defined UV completions should live within this particular cone in parameter space. So we can think about a tree level completion, uh, some massive state coupled to D Higgs squared. So for example, a massive scalar coupled to the trace of D Higgs squared. Uh, we find that that lives in the cone. We can also think about uh, massive SU2 triplet coupled to D Higgs squared. That also lives in the cone, a massive bifundamental or even a massive graviton coupled to the T mu nu of the Higgs. All of these example tree completions uh, satisfy our positivity bounds. So we've, we've checked that our, our bounds are, uh, are indeed sensible. So I mentioned earlier that we notice a pattern among these bounds that repeats over and over, that the bounds tend to come in pairs of inequalities for just positivity of certain combinations of CP conserving terms, but that we also get magnitude bounds that we get C tilde squared is less than four C one C two, where C tilde is the coefficient of the CP violating term that corresponds to C one and C two. And you can rewrite this so it's manifestly a cone. So there's some allowed cone, a right circular cone in bound space where all well-defined UV completions have to live and the forbidden region outside of it. And what this should make you think about is, is completing a square. And it's highly suggestive of, of the UV completion. So I'll show you what I mean by that. Let me take the b to the fourth terms as an, as an example. There were three b to the fourth operators, uh, b squared squared, b b tilde squared, and b squared b b tilde. Uh, we got our three bounds. c1 and c2 are positive. c tilde is less than the product. And what these bounds imply, you can show mathematically, this is equivalent to the statement that these three operators can be rewritten as a manifestly positive sum of perfect squares, that there exist real numbers, alpha, beta, and gamma that allow you to do that. And that looks like a UV completion or suggests a UV completion because I could couple a, a dilaton to uh, BB, uh, B squared or uh, an axion to BB tilde 
And if there's mass mixing between the axion and diloton, I'll get precisely an effective action of this form. So it turns out that what causality and analyticity are telling us is that UV, healthy UV completions always give you low energy Lagrangians that are qualitatively like this. So you can think about any UV completion, any UV completion that might involve loops or whatever, you can cut it and that multi-particle state you could think about as just being exchanged through some kind of tree level process like this. So all UV completions are effectively a cut loop squared uh, by virtue of causality and analyticity. So that's, that's a really important takeaway from, from what our bounds are, are showing us. But let me, let me turn now to the phenomenology of this. So previously the focus uh, experimentally has been on signals of dimension eight operators among the electroweak uh, gauge bosons in the form of the so-called anomalous quartic gauge boson couplings. And these in induce corrections uh, to the standard model in a way that can be seen through quark-quark goes to quark-quark plus two gauge boson operators. And in fact, the, the LHC groups, Atlas and CMS have put out papers bounding precisely the anomalous quartic gauge boson couplings. Uh, but, but to that question about the basis, be before our work, these papers were actually using an incomplete uh, basis of operators among the anomaly anomalous quartic gauge boson couplings. They were missing three operators in all the bounds. Uh, so, so we've now corrected that and completed uh, the basis for, for these experiments. But we can, we can look at how our bounds map onto uh, current, currently existing bounds. So here, this is the D Higgs to the fourth space, and this is CMS's constraint from 2019. And our bounds just immediately rule out half, half the parameter space. But not only that, not only the, does IR consistency sharpen our search for new physics, but it tells us new places to look. So for example, if I plot in uh, particular variables in B squared, W squared space, uh, our bounds rule out roughly three quarters of, of the parameter space. And these B squared W squared operators can be constrained using current LHC data. The analysis just hasn't been done yet. So not only do our bounds sharpen the search for new physics, but they can tell us where might be a good place to look to try and uh, test, test these axioms of QFT and to find interesting parameterizations of, of the new, new physics. Good. Even more excitingly, our bounds allow us to connect qualitatively different experimental measurements. So, for example, the relations between the CP and CP, CP even and CP odd operators suggest that there might be something interesting to say about neutron EDMs. And in fact, there is. So, the neutron electric dipole moment, uh, if you ask about what's the dot product between the neutron spin and its electric dipole, that violates time reversal symmetry, because if you switch the direction of time, that means you switch the direction it's spinning, but the dipole's unchanged, so that flips under, under time reversal symmetry. By the CPT theorem and uh, quantum field theory, this means it's a CP odd uh, operator, CP violating operator. And famously, the GG tilde operator has a small coupling. This is a strong CP problem. So it's possible that the dominant neutron EDM could arise through higher dimension operators of the sort that we bound. And you can estimate, so if the neutron EDM arises through a G cube G tilde operator, like, like we bound, what's the neutron EDM? And in, in units of a TeV, it goes like the Wilson coefficient times 10 to the minus 28 E centimeters. Uh, this is only two orders of magnitude uh, below present bounds on the neutron electric dipole moment. So current experiments are probing this scale to hundreds of GeV. So what's exciting about this is that if these low energy experiments of uh, trying to measure the neutron EDM were to see a non-zero EDM from dimension eight operators in the next few years, this would mean that by virtue of our analyticity and causality results, that the analogous CP even operators also have to exist and have to be at least as large, uh, meaning that they would be observable at the LHC. So you would have a guarantee of discovery of new physics at colliders uh, by virtue of these deep properties uh, from, from quantum field theory. Good. So I now want to turn to uh, the fermionic operators and, and see what, what can we say about fermions in the standard model. So let me consider four point fermionic operators that have two extra derivatives. So operators that are dimension eight. And uh, the ingredients are, will be the standard model fermions, uh, come in SU3 triplets, SU2 doublets, uh, the quarks and leptons, 
Uh, but importantly, the, the important feature for us right now is that each field has a generation index running from one up to NF, where in the standard model, NF is three. There are three generations, the electron, muon, and tau, uh, for example, or the analogous uh, uh, generations among the quarks. And these define the flavor quantum numbers, electron number, charm, et cetera. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to scatter a superposition of generations, a superposition of flavors of fermions and see what can analyticity, what can the amplitudes program tell us about these Wilson coefficients. So let me consider this operator. Uh, its Wilson coefficient is now not a number, but a tensor uh, that lives in flavor space with indices index MNPQ. And it's d mu of a current E bar gamma nu E times d mu of, of again, a current. Good. So uh, let me compute the scattering amplitude here. Alpha, beta, gamma, and delta are the wave function coefficients telling me what kind of superposition am I scattering. And if I consider forward scattering, that tells me my out state has to equal my in state. And I can compute the forward amplitudes. And it goes like CMNPQ dotted into the wave function coefficients times S squared, which has to be positive by analyticity, as we saw earlier. So what unitarity and analyticity require is that CMNPQ dotted into alpha, beta, beta star, alpha star has to be positive for arbitrary vectors. And so let me write that as uh, C alpha beta. So we have some positivity on this, on this matrix of, of Wilson coefficients that we, that we find by virtue of analyticity. So before applying this to the full, full blown fermionic standard model EFT, let me uh, ask what is, what is this qualitatively telling me? So let's consider a toy theory. Uh, that has only two flavors, so I can actually draw it. And let's let it be CP conserving, so all the Wilson coefficients are real. And let me put some constraints on the Wilson coefficients to make things simpler. I'll write C0 as this uh, flavor conserving coefficient. C1 and C2 violate flavor symmetry by one unit or two units. And I'll define these ratios, x0, x1, x2. And I find that the allowed region of parameter space are these finite uh, finite regions shown here or in 3D uh, here. So you can call this, if you like, a, a flavohedron. It's some, some shape in flavor space where all of the well-defined UV completions have to live. Good. So now let me build uh, the fermionic uh, standard model EFT and, and let's see what we get. So I'll define some more currents. Uh, we get, these are just like the currents from before, but possibly with SU2 or SU3 generators jammed in. Also define some tensors, k mu nu. These are related to uh, the, the Dirac stress energy tensor for a fermion. You can, you can build a t mu nu of a fermion using k mu nu. OK, but in terms of these objects, we have the various uh, components of the fermionic standard model EFT. We have uh, self-cortex and two different types of cross-cortex. And so we can apply all of our bounds to this full set of operators. And so not only will we choose all sorts of different fermions to scatter, but we'll also marginalize over direction in uh, SU2 and SU3 charge space. Just like earlier uh, for the gluons, we marginalized over color to obtain the best possible uh, bounds. Here, I'm, I'm marginalizing over arbitrary direction in charge space. And when I do that, I find uh, a, a bunch of different families of bounds on the fermionic standard model EFT. Uh, I find various bounds on the quark self-cortex because, again, of the freedom in SU2 and SU3 charge. But importantly, they're all of the qualitatively similar form to the example operator I showed you. They're all some Wilson coefficient tensor or combination of Wilson coefficient tensors dotted into uh, the alpha and beta vectors. And that's what's required to be positive. So uh, some of our operators can serve flavor, of course. Uh, so for example, the E bar E, E bar E has two positrons and two electrons coming in. It conserves flavor. But the operator uh, mu bar E, uh, E bar tau uh, has one electron, one positron, one anti-muon, and one tau coming in. So it violates muon number and tau number by one unit. So what can we say about these flavor violating operators? Well. If we consider scattering, for example, an electron off of an arbitrary superposition of a muon and tau, we find that the flavor violating operator is upper bounded by the products of flavor conserving operators, just like we found for CP. So the flavor violating coupling, couplings are always smaller than their flavor conserving cousins. And this has important phenomenological implications. 
Uh, the same conclusion also ports over to the CP violating operators in even in the fermionic theory. So like I said, this gives interesting prospects for detection. Our, our bounds allow us to link qualitatively different experiments. For example, low energy precision measurements with higher energy colliders. Uh, a notable example is muon to electron conversion. So there's an experiment that's looking for the decay of a muon to two electrons and a positron. Uh, it's, it's searching for this particular branching, branching ratio. And if it were to find it mod, uh, modulated by this dimension six operator, our bound would imply non-zero uh, values for the flavor conserving analogs, which again could be tested at colliders in the dilepton distribution. So that's the story for dimension eight, but I now want to sort of break a theoretical barrier, which is dimension six operators. So the standard model, of course, famously starts at lower mass dimension than mass dimension eight. There's the Weinberg operator at dimension five, but things really get going at dimension six, uh, where there's the basis enumerated in, uh, in the Warsaw group's paper here. So it's well motivated to think about, can we use any of this technology to bound dimension six operators? And previous to our, our paper, the answer was, was essentially no, because if you think about four fermion operators, uh, they have amplitudes that go like momentum squared. So they go like Mandelstam, S, T, and U. Now the optical theorem applies in the forward limit uh, when T is zero. So the amplitude either uh, is zero or it flips sign under crossing symmetry in the forward limit. And this obstructs a straightforward application of uh, forward positivity bounds because you don't get something that's positive definite when you do the contour integral. So what can we do? Well, one observation is that you know, the, the optical theorem comes in part because the Legendre polynomials all pass through one when cosine theta equals one. So they're all positive. But we know more about the Legendre polynomials than just their value in the forward limit. We also know that all their derivatives are positive. So it behooves us to think about what about derivatives in T, uh, derivatives with respect to the forward limit. And so we can extract a particular combination of S and T derivatives uh, from the amplitude to get the following expression. So uh, derivatives of t around the forward limit, both of these are positive. Uh, this is negative, so we haven't yet gotten something positive. Uh, let me define my notation. A alpha beta will be the amplitude for electron positron scattering or quark anti-quark, so opposite helicity scattering with some superposition of flavors. And A alpha bar beta will be the crossing symmetrized version of that. So where I'm scattering same helicity states with complex conjugated. Uh, wave function coefficients. Okay, now we can understand this object better if we do a partial wave expansion. But for opposite helicity scattering, the initial total angular momentum is one, uh, not zero. So that means there's no S wave, just like there's no uh, S wave radiation for a photon. So the partial wave expansion isn't done using Legendre's, but instead has to be done using the so-called Jacob Wick expansion into final states of definite total angular momentum. Uh, this is done using the Wigner small d matrices. And crucially, the polynomials are different than Legendre's. They're, they're slightly different and in a way that will be important. So if we do the partial wave expansion in this way and explicitly rewrite it out in terms of final angular momentum, we can rearrange uh, all the functions carefully into a sum of manifestly positive terms. Uh, here, the Im imaginary parts of the partial waves are positive by unitarity, and these functions are manifestly positive functions of J, the final angular momentum of the internal state. So what we found is a new positivity bound on some combination of derivatives of amplitudes that applies even for dimension six. And we've only used three assumptions that the UV physics is Lorentz invariant, unitary and local as one always assumes, uh, that in the deep UV, the amplitudes diverge more weakly with large momentum than in the IR EFT, and that the derivative Jacob Wick expansion converges. Now, if, if, one, if number two or three are violated, that means you could get a bound in what for us would be the forbidden region, but that's still phenomenologically useful because it would tell you something uh, qualitative about the type of UV completion. It would tell you how quickly or how slowly the partial waves must, must be falling off. So this is, even though this is using stronger, uh, slightly stronger assumptions than, than at dimension eight, it's still a uh, experiment. So I can write out the full dimension six standard model EFT. Uh, I get fermion self-cortex and cross-cortex. 
And I again get the same kind of bounds. I get that various combinations of Wilson coefficients uh, dotted into alpha, alpha star, beta star, beta are positive by virtue of the analytic structure of scattering amplitudes and unitarity. And this is the first time that model independent bounds like this, bounds that don't care about what you, the completion you have, have been derived for the full matter content of the standard model using the analytic structure, just the analytic structure of scattering amplitudes. So this is, this is really exciting. It, it, it shattered a, uh, what before was a, a barrier in the literature. And again, there are really cool prospects for detection. If I write the flavor violating scale as lambda tilde and the flavor conserving scale as lambda, our bounds tell us that lambda is smaller than lambda tilde. And if I ask, what does this mean for the mu3e experiment? Well, uh, given the targeted uh, branching, branching fraction, you would find lambda tilde of about 80 to 800 TeV, which is far above uh, near-term colliders. But in tau decay, it's more interesting. Uh, current bounds on flavor violating tau decay uh, put the lambda tilde scale at around 7 TeV or higher. And this will be improved to around 25 TeV by the Bell 2 experiment uh, in Japan pictured here. So if uh, the Bell 2 experiment were to find flavor violation in tau decay, then our bounds would imply that there would be flavor conserving uh, processes among the leptons, among the taus, at again around the 10 TeV scale. And this scale is going to be probed soon. The LHC already is probing lambda of order one or two TeV. So 10 TeV is just an order of magnitude above that and could be proved maybe uh, at the high luminosity LHC or at, at, at a later collider. So this is very exciting that we would again be able to predict uh, detections of new, new physics using flavor violation and using our uh, our bounds that come from very general considerations of uh, sort of formal properties about field theory. So just uh, to, to say a few more words about the outlook for this program of research. There are a whole lot of really interesting avenues for future work. Uh, we want to find more connections between CP even and CP odd measurements. Uh, we haven't yet considered scattering of superpositions of different representations in the standard model. For example, you can formally compute the S matrix for a superposition of an electron in a quark. And if you did that, you would turn on baryon and lepton violating operators. So maybe we could say something about the size of operators that contribute to proton decay relative to other operators. That would be exciting. Uh, we could apply even more bounds that go beyond the forward limit, uh, the technology of the EFT hedron uh, developed by Nimar Khani Hamed and others. But more generally, even beyond the standard model, as, as I mentioned, this, these bounds on the standard model EFT are just one part of a big program of research on infrared consistency that, that I've been working on for a long time. And we can even constrain the behavior of theories beyond Einstein gravity. So as I mentioned, you can treat gravity as an effective field theory, expanding in terms of a flat metric plus a graviton. And so we, we know how to do quantum gravity below the Planck scale uh, perturbatively. You can read off the propagator, the three point, four point, et cetera, Feynman diagrams. But importantly, you know, any theory of quantum gravity will induce deviations, corrections away from the Einstein equations in the form of higher derivative terms in the action. And you can ask, is it possible to say anything about the nature of these corrections, these quantum corrections to the Einstein equation, uh, independent of the details of quantum gravity? And it turns out the answer is yes. And as, as I mentioned in my talk a couple of weeks ago, that has important implica implications and connections to string theory, uh, connections to the weak gravity conjecture and the broader string swamp lamp program. Uh, how, how can charged black holes decay? And uh, is, is quantum field theory always telling us the same thing as, as string theory? And so far, we've been finding the answer is yes. Or even uh, cosmological implications. We can consider bounding the potential of the massive graviton in the theory of uh, Duram, Gabadatse, and Tali. And we find that there's a, a finite allowed region of parameter space. So this whole infrared consistency program has a huge number of uh, potential applications, ranging from cosmology to particle physics to questions in formal field theory. And so it's, it's a really exciting time to, to be doing this. Just to put this in context, uh, I work in a broad array of uh, questions in quantum field theory and quantum gravity, ranging from bounding the laws of physics to scattering, scattering amplitudes program, classical general relativity, and the quantum properties of black holes and their connections to quantum entanglement and holography. 
And so this talk is essentially this uh, region of, uh, of this parameter space, particularly the standard model EFT. But I'm, I'm happy to talk to uh, any of you guys, uh, either you know, whenever or offline, about any, any part of this research. But the, the basic takeaways from, from this talk are that infrared consistency gives us an amazing, uh, powerful set of new tools for constraining uh, physics. In fact, we're still continuing to discover uh, more tools in the IR consistency program. Uh, in particular, in this talk, we've seen how causality, unitarity, and locality in the structure of amplitudes allow us to bound the couplings from physics beyond the standard model and connect them with accessible experiments. And one of the amazing things about the IR consistency program is that it brings people together from the phenomenology community, from the modern amplitudes methods community, uh, practitioners of quantum field theory, uh, string theory, and gravity. And it gives us a really great new bridge between formal theory and phenomenology, and it connects physics at different energy scales and allows us to test uh, what we think we know about QFT up to very high energies and use that to sharpen our search for new physics. So with that, thank you very much and happy to take any more questions. Thank you. Thank you for uh, the beautiful talk. Um, uh, before opening the, um, the field, I had just two questions. Well, first is Jacob Wick. I, I knew both of them, so it's, uh, but more importantly, my, my question is, uh, are your bounds stable under adding to the standard model a light but very weakly coupled particle that we have not seen, because not because it's heavy, but because it's weakly coupled? Mm, OK, uh, that is interesting. Let me see. Yes, uh, the, the, the short answer should, well, yes, the, the short answer should be yes. And, and here's why. Um, so when, when we're considering, for example, scattering of uh, two Higgs to two Higgs or two gluons to two gluons, right? Um, unless that, uh, unless loops of that particle contribute uh, strongly to the S matrix that contains just the standard model, uh, it, it won't matter for our, for our bounds. And loops of that particle shouldn't uh, contribute strongly to the pure standard model S matrix, because otherwise we would have, we would have detected that, that deviation already. Okay. Thank you. Uh, said another way, it's because, because the bounds are post-selecting on the final states too, you're, you're requiring initial state equals final state that, that you, you effectively exclude uh, those. I was thinking actually uh, about an, a three-level exchange diagram of a particle. Oh, okay. No okay. But it, if, mm, mm. if it's, well, if it's light, but still so weakly, well, if it's still super weakly coupled, um, I, I, I think we, well, yes, un unless we would have seen it already, uh, yeah, the, the bounds are stable under that. Thank you. Um, other questions? Please ask. Nothing is too elementary or too complex. Oh, uh, why the, someone asked why about the last claim. So, um, right. So it, th this, I think, was about uh, Massimo's question uh, regarding uh, light states. So, so the idea here is, suppose we had some super light particle coupled to, coupled to two Higgs. So in the two Higgs to two Higgs scattering, you have, you have some, something that's almost a pole, something that acts like almost a, a long range force, but it's, but it's incredibly uh, weakly coupled. Well, what, what that'll do is at, at extremely low energies, if you're, if you're at energies below the scale of that particle, uh, that'll just give you an effective d Higgs to the fourth and it'll act like something massive. But if we're scattering at, at uh, scales above that, um, there will be there will be some pull from that, but it's not going to contribute to the effective d Higgs to the fourth operator at a TeV scale because its amplitude will have will have effectively unitarized uh, by then. It, it won't look like it won't look like s squared. It'll look like uh, s s to some lower power because you're you're from the point of view of that particle you're in the UV there. Uh, I hope that answers. Uh, the question. 
Thank you. Yeah, th th this might be a uh, philosophical question, Grant. Well, first of all, thank you very much for the very nice presentation. But uh, uh, I don't know if it is philosophical, but you know, if you give up on Lorentz invariance and you know, thinking of condensed matter systems and field theories applied to condensed matter systems or non-relativistic field theories, put that that way. Right. Uh, could one still try to uh, come up with uh, uh, con constraint, you know, UV IR constraints along the lines that you are talking about with Lorentz and one is removed? Let's yeah, say. A a absolutely. It's 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 a challenge, but it's a challenge that uh, that people are are rising to. So um, the distinction I want to make is between giving up some Lorentz invariance versus giving up all Lorentz invariance. And in particular, if, if we consider giving up, uh, giving up boosts, but keeping translations and rotations, uh, there was a beautiful paper out uh, last month by, uh, by Scott Melville and collaborator, uh, mm -hmm. where they showed that if you give up boosts, but keep rotations and translations, you can still adapt this technology that, that I, sketch for the D5 to the four theory to apply to positivity bounds in, in that case. And that's really interesting because as, as you point out, not only can you bound condensed matter systems, but you can bound uh, the EFT of inflation then. And so then you can connect uh, all of this stuff to bound uh, non-Gaussianities that you could see in the CMB. And for, for them, the, the key insight from that paper, as, as I recall, was the, the, the problem when you break Lorentz invariance is that um, crossing symmetry works differently. Uh, the, the, two, the two channels on the positive and negative real S axis are, are related to each other more, uh, well, somewhat differently. And so implementing crossing in a way that is uh, compatible with the analyticity calculation was previously the uh, roadblock that, but that has recently been overcome. So yes, uh, the, the road is open to bounding, uh, bounding all sorts of theories now. Good, thank you. Thanks. You? Yeah, I, I also have a question. Okay, sure. Uh, so, so does your talk mean, uh, shows a clue that uh, every operator which violates the sound symmetry might be um, uh, might be overbounded by the operators which doesn't violate such symmetry? Is this a generic uh, claim? I'm I'm considering something like the dimension six operator, which violates the custodial symmetry, will this also behave like this similarly? Um, I think that's a, well, let me see. Yeah, I, th I think that's a, that is a reasonable conjecture to make from our bounds. I mean, so any, any U1 uh, type of symmetry, this will be true for. Uh, any, anything that you can well, any any symmetry that corresponds to a scattering process where I can I can probe what, uh, operators that violate this symmetry by scattering things in superpositions, um, this this will apply for. So yeah, uh, custodial symmetry it it should apply for. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, hi, th this is this is Kyle again. I. I uh... I was curious, um, in terms of the way that you're thinking about these constraints, uh, and one of the th comments that you made at the beginning of the talk, um, you know, like for instance, when you compare to experimental results, I I'm just curious if you're thinking of it more as just you know constraining the part of the parameter space that we should pay attention to. So just saying, you know, just ignore this part because it's not consistent, uh, or you, you had said something like, you know, if the LHC results were in that kind of excluded region that you would be learning something fundamental about, uh, you know, about quantum field theory not being local or, you know, violating one of these, you know, sacred right. principles. Um, I don't know how I many, if you would uh, actually believe, a, you know, a two sigma LHC results sitting in the thing and to say like localities <laughs> not there. I, so I'm I, just curious. I, what, I would need many know, more it, stigma it, than that to believe <laughs> in violation of locality. But yeah, uh, so I, I think it, it's sort of like, I'm not saying the theorists sh or, or I'm not saying the experimentalists shouldn't just you know go ahead and, and measure whatever they can measure, but I think that they should sort of report the constraints in in two tiers, if that makes sense. Like uh, here are the constraints that we get, and here's the statistical significance we get if we take into account these positivity bounds that require uh, you know, locality, unitarity, etc. And here are the constraints that we get if, if we don't. 
So, I mean, that's that's kind of the math, maximally agnostic and, and approach to take and the approach that maximizes potential for discovery is just to, to say both things. Um, yeah, okay. And then, but so in that sense, it doesn't really modify the, I mean, other than the kind of providing two, two res results, uh, it doesn't really modify the approach that's being taken. But I guess sometimes when relating different experiments together, you're saying that these constraints can lead to some kind of when, slightly yeah, more... It's, it's, uh, yeah, exactly. In, in a single in, in a single experiment, you're just going to you're just going to always put some ellipses around the origin, and this is going to modify the statistical significance you report, you know, ex post facto. But yeah, exactly. The the really su more surprising power of this comes from if if you saw something non-zero in one of these symmetry violating experiments, CP or flavor or anything else, then you could turn that into a very definitive prediction for what you could see. Uh, among the symmetry conserving operators at other experiments. Exactly. Yeah, great, thank you. Please ask, uh, especially if we have students. So I suppose that one question uh, that comes several times in this when discussing analyticity is actually, sorry, uh, the question that I, I wanted to ask again is pseudo philosophical. Um, you used at the beginning of the talk some um, um, causality constraints using um, the young mills field. Yeah. Right. Not directly observable, right? Yeah, but right, right. Still we feel, uh, confident that we can, mm, that the underlying classical Lagrangian should obey those constraints. Mm -hmm. Is it because if we didn't, then when we do say perturbative quantization, nothing works? Well, or I mean, even, even, even more kind of viscerally, I could still, even, even if I can't observe the field directly, I can still construct uh, an observable with it by, by coupling it to something else. So suppose, you know, suppose I have some, matter uh, floating around in this condensate that couples to the gauge field, uh, some, some quarks or something. Um, if I send some signal faster than light and it, you know, it, it disturbs my, uh, my matter system, um, I can use that to send signals backwards in time and that, should, that, shouldn't, uh, that shouldn't be allowed. So you know, e even if you can't observe the, the field itself, if, it, you know, if it's coupling to something physical, you can, you can still construct an, an observable out of it. Thank you. A, a more technical question is whether you can use the same uh, classical bounds, the same uh, causality and non-superluminal motion bound with fermions, because you uh, you didn't. I, I didn't I didn't show that with fermions, but uh, you 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 can. Um, in fact, well. Right. The the why it's slightly trickier with fermions is because you can't you can't have a VEV of a single uh, of a fermion. You have to have a VEV of a of a condensate of like uh, psi bar psi. You can still do it because these are quartic operators. So you can get you can construct some VEV of psi bar psi, and then you're scattering some uh, well some fermion through it and asking about its propagation. Uh, we 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 simply didn't didn't do the computation that way just because by that point having well. Having gone through all the bosons and having seen that causality and analyticity were always telling us the same thing, uh, we we dispensed with causality and and just went with the quantum mechanical calculation. But yeah, it, it'll be qualitatively the same sort of thing. Dimension six, it won't be though. Uh, the dimension six, that that sort of bound was was qualitatively different, and so um, I don't know of a way to get even more broadly the EFT hedron bounds of Nima and company um, purely through causality. That actually is an interesting question. If you hand someone a scattering amplitude that's just a function of the Mandelstam variables and ask, did this come from a causal theory or not? Uh, that there is not an if and only if set of statements on the functional form of an amplitude that can, that can tell you yes or no. Thank you. Do we have other questions? Maybe if not, we can actually thank Grant again and Thank let him rest for a few minutes before he meets the students. That would be at the 3.15, right? So Sounds great. Have a lot of time. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks again.